Hey guys, so this is a little brief overview of the uh, interactive mega shader that I made for y'all. Um, just gonna go over some of the basic controls, basic functionality, and show you how to use it and how to get the, uh, the best results out of it. It might look a little intimidating, but just bear with me here. I think you'll get it by the end of this. Before I dive in, I just want to address some of the basic default behaviors of the shader. Um, primarily that the assets using it are going to fade out as they approach the camera. Uh, the goal of this is really just that we want the player to fly through these kind of fields, so having the camera not clip assets is a good thing. Um, that's especially important because using this on large objects with big colliders and having it become transparent when you get close is going to be bad for gameplay. Okay, so I'm going to get started by showing you guys how to recreate this effect right here. So uh, these are the reads that we have in the game right now. And they're very interactive with regards to player position. So right very first thing in the shader, you've got these X, Y, Z coordinates, um, and you can change these, and in real time you'll be able to see how they affect the, uh, the shader itself. Um, and so just imagine that the plane is sitting right at the middle of that point. So I'm going to show you guys how to set that up right now. So this is just the base geometry for those reads. What's great about the shader is that you should only need two inputs, the geometry itself and the vertex colors on that geometry. And with this, you can see I've got you know the tips painted black and the bottoms the default white color. So the goal of vertex painting these objects is to just simply paint the part that you want to move. The shader will interpret the vertex color information and you'll be able to define behaviors based on it. So to get started, um, you're just going to come down to your project, go to create material, name it whatever you want to, and then under the shader drop down, go to interspace, interactive mega. Uh, I've actually already got one set up for this tutorial, so I'm just going to use that one. But whenever you do create it, you should see just default values just like this. If these boxes are checked or there are any random values in here, best thing to do is just uncheck all the boxes and start from scratch. Anyway, I'm going to apply it to my object, um, and you'll see we've got just some basic colors set up right now. So first thing to do, and first thing listed in the shader, is going to be your colors. Primary element or primary behavior is all caps, and then parameters for it are listed beneath it. So right off the bat, you can see that we've got two colors set up, and those are being driven by the vertex color values. So one of them, color base, I'm just going to make this um, a light purple, kind of like what we had in the, uh, the original reads. And that's going to be this white value down here. Um, this, the other value is going to be on top, and I'm just going to make that, I think it was kind of a, a light red, something like that. But there are also these other options like emission, so you can you know cause these colors to bloom out, um, or balance, which is just the amount of one color or the other, and then fall off, which is going to be the sharpness of that divide. So you can see how that gets sharper or softer. So I'm going to bring, I'm going to bring the fall off down a bit, and then I'm going to push this down so the reed is mostly red and the base is mostly that purple color. So I want to drop down here for a minute and go to vertex opacity. So I'm just going to enable that, and you'll actually see that based on the vertex colors, those areas will become transparent. You've also got an invert option here, so you can invert that value and make the opposite colors become transparent. Beyond that, again, just like the color values up here, you've got balance and you've got your fall off, so you can control how sharp or how sharp that is, excuse me. So I'm gonna bring this down here. And one of the coolest things that I've found recently is that by making the bases of these, a bit transparent, kind of like this. Whenever you put them on a landscape, you don't have to worry about clipping because the color of the landscape just comes through the open spots in the dither, so it looks very grounded. So I'm gonna leave it like this. Okay, so what I've got here is just a big array of all of these individual objects. So you can see each one of these is just one of those stocks that we were working with earlier. Let's dive into some of these other options right here because these are really exciting. So the very first one that I want to draw your attention to is uh, global oscillation. So global oscillation is what it sounds like. It makes the thing move. Think of it like a waveform. You can control the scale of the waves. You can control the amplitude of the waves. And you can also control the speed of their movement. Now you'll note something here. The editor view is moving a lot faster than the game view. Uh, and I'm in play mode. For reasons that I'm not going to dive into here, 
whenever you're in play mode, you see the true speed, oscillation values, and all of that kind of behaviors versus whenever you're not in play and just looking at it in edit mode. Some of it has to do with the way uh, the geometry is merged together when it's static, um, but suffice to say, whenever you're working on these, just edit the shader values in play mode to get those final tweaks to the behavior. So I'm going to slow this down because obviously that's not what we want. Um, and I'm going to change the scale on these uh, on this waveform a bit just to get something kind of like that. Keep the amplitude where it is, sure. Um, and then increase the speed, yeah. So okay, so that looks pretty cool. And you'll actually notice that it moves in a wave as well. But you'll also notice that the bottoms of these are moving, which is not what we want. So again, using the vertex colors that we have, um, there's an option here called vertex clamp. If you slide that forward, you'll notice that the areas that were painted black get their movement gets clamped. So you can control you know, how much of that clamp you want to affect it. And you can also, just like anything else, invert it, which gives you more versatility. Okay, so we've got the bases clamped down. We've got a pretty nice, gentle breeze going here. Let's, uh, let's get it to respond to the player. So first thing I'm gonna do is just geometry proximity response. Turn that on. Um, and I'm going to crank up the strength all the way to one. So you'll see that all of the all of these reads are being drawn to a specific point here, and that's going to be your zero 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 world space point. So within this, you've got radius controls for how much or how little you want it to affect. You've got attraction versus repulsion, so you can push the things away from you, or you can make them reach towards you as you fly by. Uh, and then you've also got a multiplier for that strength. So you can really bring it in if you want to. Um, or you can really, really push these guys out if you really want a strong, violent response. So you can also see that they actually reach up in all directions, depending on your approach. So the multiplier will affect the strength of that. The radius will also affect that area. So you can use those values to kind of balance things out a bit. I'm just going to put it at 3 for now. So similar to the geometry proximity response, we're also going to go down to color proximity response. I'm just going to turn that on. And just in the same exact way, you can control the radius of this area, as well as the sharpness of the fall off on it. With this color, you can overdrive it. And you can also do that with all of your other colors if you want to. So again, lots of lots of flexibility here, lots of versatility here. Uh, so I'm going to overdrive this value a little bit. Um, bring the radius down a bit. And if you, you saw me toggle something in here, I'll explain that in just a second. Bring the radius down, turn the fall off way up so I can get something a little softer, a little bit prettier like that. Make sure we got some good bloom happening in the middle. Uh, actually, I'm just going to pump that up. Let's go hard. Let's do it live. More, more softness. Bring the uh, radius down a little bit more. Sure, something like that feels good. I'm just going to make this a little bit brighter. Yeah, that's pretty. Okay, so obviously, just like the uh, just like the geometry placement, this will also follow your your player. But you'll notice actually that there's a bit of a trail that I'm leaving behind here. That right there. So there are two points in here. There are two different radius inputs, um, and that's because we're actually tracking two points for this color thing. And it's basically a trail that the player will leave behind. Um, so what's cool about this is that I can make the secondary point much larger than the than the first player point. So you, you hit the read and you keep flying forward and then the wake of energy grows outward behind you and then eventually dissipates over time. I'm going to drop that back at zero but just be aware that you have that option. So cool, we got that going. Um, next thing, opacity proximity response. Again, going to be similar to the top two. Um, the only difference is that it controls the opacity of this stuff instead, which is important because if the plane's right in the middle of this, you don't want this geometry to visibly clip through it. So the easiest way around this, honestly, is to just make it a little bit invisible around the plane. Easy. Kind of hacky. I'm okay with it. Uh, it works. So. Yeah, so when the plane flies through here, now you're going to just have this little buffer zone where it'll be safe. So, plane flies through, doesn't collide with anything, camera also doesn't collide with anything, we're getting a lot of really cool 
bright and color responsiveness, um, geometries, warping, things that are oscillating. Cool, we got our reads. Just like that, just by combining the standard behaviors in the shader. Okay, so now I'm going to go over um, just a bit about utilizing vertex painting to get more specific behaviors and to get a little bit better control. These two are the same pieces of geometry, and these two are the same pieces of geometry, just these the top two have the shader applied. So you'll notice in, um, in this piece I've got just a single ring with black in the center, white at the edge, and a linear fall off. With this one though, I've actually got multiple rings and I've got a curved fall off. And as a result, the offset that you see in these is going to be uh, very linear because the colors are linear, or you'll get a curve on the displacement because the vertex painting was curved. You'll also notice that in here I've got the center value and then all the values around this ring, those are all the same zero black color, which means that unlike with this one where it ends in a point, this one actually ends in a flat cap. So again, more ways to kind of control what you're doing just with some vertex painting. So you can start to see some of the different kind of versatility that we get out of, out of using the shader. Okay, so this one's really fun. Um, look at the, uh, just keep your eyes on the, the game view for a second. So I kind of like to think of these as like invisible jellyfish that are kind of floating in the ocean, right? And then as the player gets close, like just a little bit becomes apparent. Whatever's hanging from, from the bottom of the jellyfish becomes apparent. Obviously it'd be better with like, you know, actual jellyfish assets, but for now you can see the behavior at least is, uh, is appropriate. So you've got little dots calmly floating around, but you'll notice actually that the movement is much more drastic in the center where the player is. Uh, so that's because I have this uh, option down here. So you've got the oscillation that's used globally on the whole piece, but I've got a multiplier for the area around you. Um, so you can actually make it oscillate much faster around you or much more slowly around you than the, than the surrounding area. Uh, so you could use that for bushes that you fly by, you want them to, you know, the leaves to blow really fast as you zoom past them. Um, or you could have little critters that get scared and, you know, stand really still and then start moving again. So you can get some, you know, personality and behavior out of the assets that we're making. Um, also, you'll notice that I've got pieces being revealed instead of hidden as I fly through them. Um, and that's going to be the same behavior uh, as the opacity proximity response. The only difference is that I've got this invert toggled. So you can see that where the plane is located, it goes, it becomes invisible, um, which is the normal behavior that we had. So going in and inverting that causes everything to be invisible except what's just around you. So using this for fun reveals is, is really cool. Because of the nature of the shader, it lets us reuse a lot of the assets that we've already made um, in really kind of new and interesting ways. So you'll see I've got a creature skull of some kind and I've just applied the shader to it and tweaked some values and you can see I've actually got a kind of interesting almost semi-transparent effect going and the way I got that was using the uh, again the vertex opacity options over here and then just controlling the balance and the fall off of those and so using the different parameters that we have in here as the player gets closer to it, you can actually make it look like it's like being eaten away or like it's on fire and like kind of kind of burning out before kind of reappearing. And I think that's really cool. So having that shader applied to various assets that we already have um, allows us to get some really, really interesting behaviors. And this is, this is what's so important to me. You guys are going to be able to use this with existing assets to make a whole lot of versatility and variety. Uh, for underwater interactions and underwater uh, scenery. But like that's such a cool, like that looks so cool to just swim through. Oh man, I think that's rad. So here's an example of a, of a different kind of application. Um, so this is just using basically a tube with uh, vertex paint in the middle, um, which lets me clamp the edges here and let the middle kind of oscillate and wander around. So just picture this in a uh, in a tunnel, for example, right? So like, 
cause them to like move out of the way as they kind of push through them. So that's particularly interesting to me for a couple of reasons. Um, but mostly that because these don't require colliders, they're not any like real danger to the player. So at that point, we can actually use these to mask certain paths or to, to kind of conceal areas a little bit and make it more of an event when the player does discover those. So unlike the pillars, um, these guys are cool to me because we can actually use them as obstacles in the world as well. So you'll notice this guy has a sphere collider on it. Um, and just so you can see, this is all that the object is. It's just a sphere with just a, just a sphere here with uh, little little circles in it, and again, vertex paint in the middle of those circles. So the behavior with this one, um, I think, is pretty cool because we can make it read like like it's dangerous or something. So if the player, for instance, flies by it, we can make it very abruptly create these spikes. And while the player isn't going to get damaged by the spikes, but the player will run into the sphere collider that's on the actual object itself. So where some are peaceful, ambient responses, we can also have some threatening responses as well. All right, guys. So that'll just about wrap it up for this little overview. Um, I think given enough time and enough experimentation, you'll be able to build up some familiarity with these and uh, be able to create a lot of really, really cool, really, really interesting interactions for the player. So I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys make. And uh, yeah, thanks for checking it out.